All right, welcome to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel welcome to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of the event or visit iwp.edu. Um, to support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. Um, before we be begin the lecture, we ask that you take a moment to silence all devices. Um, today, we will be hearing from Dr. Gabor Gizmazia, who will deliver a lecture on America on Europe's Eastern Frontier. This lecture is part of IWP's series on the Intermarium, spon sponsored by this, our Center for, for Intermarium Studies. Dr. Tizmazia is a research fellow at the Institute of American Studies at the University of Public Service in Budapest. His main research is contemporary U.S. foreign and security policy and transatlantic relations with particular attention to East Central Europe. He holds an MA in International Studies and a PhD in Security Studies and Military Sciences. Dr. Tizmazia provides lectures at the University of Public Service in IR theories, American foreign policy, transatlantic relations, and geopolitics in Central Europe. However, he also works in the private sector at um, Euro Atlantic Consulting and, Inve and, and Investment, analyzing current issues in East Central European military and energy security. <coughs> he is an alumnus and scholars program participant of the George C. Marshall Center for European Security Studies and a former guest researcher at the George Washington University. Dr. Chizmazia regularly appears in Hungarian media discussing current issues of the United States' foreign policy and domestic politics. Welcome, Dr. Gabor Chizmazia. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gabor Chizmazia. Uh, I think everything has been said about me in, in, the, in a nutshell, basically. Uh, I come from Hungary. Uh, and what I'm trying to look at today's uh, uh, lecture, for which I thank you very much, the Institute and all of you for your hospitality and giving you a welcome. And uh, a special thank, uh, thank you online to uh, Dave Sanders, one of the graduates here at the Institute who kind of made this possible, made this connection possible. So thank you very much uh, to all of you for the opportunity. Uh, what I would like to uh, summarize with, within an hour, so it's basically what I personally see uh, in uh, East Central Europe specifically regarding the United States military and uh, energy uh, security related pr uh, presence. Uh, I understand it's a huge topic, so I'm not trying to give you uh, a deep overview uh, of the issue. I'd just like to kind of send what the main uh, points that, uh, that I see uh, in, these, uh, in these areas. And I'm pretty sure that certain elements you see in the presentation you already are aware of. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and, uh, and also remarks and notes uh, in this regard. I don't claim to uh, have all the, the answers or solutions to all these issues. I don't think, uh, if I may say, nobody does because uh, we're currently what makes this issue very hot right now, obviously, is the tragic uh, events uh, uh, in, in Ukraine and Russia's war against, uh, against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, something that uh, I believe... Uh, no, no nation that deserves what, what the, the Ukrainian people are going through right now. Uh, so it is uh, a very, very hot topic in terms of a, a, a humanitarian perspective uh, and also from a geopolitical and international relations, even economic perspectives, uh, if I may uh, add so. I'll try to highlight uh, all of these things uh, and uh, looking forward to pretty much not your questions, but more importantly, your remarks and notes and your thoughts. I'm very eager to, to hear them. Uh, so what I'd like to uh, do in the presentation is basically highlight uh, four, two to four <coughs> points. Uh, number one is that historically, uh, this is a number of the situation that East Central Europe or Central and Eastern Europe sometimes referred to, by which I mean the, well, they say the, the new members of NATO, although we're talking about almost like one in 20 or two decades now. So all the, the former Soviet uh, forced allies countries, Allied countries who are now members of either the European Union and uh, NATO itself. So by that I mean the East Central Europe. Uh, it's a very historically unprecedented situation that we are right now because of course we can say that there has been 
a huge attention from Washington on this area when it came to Euro Atlantic integration, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, however, not to this extent, obviously, due to uh, the, uh, the tragic war that's going on in Ukraine. The other thing relates to this uh, point is that these countries have become or are becoming truly frontline states. In a sense, they already are. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a separate issue when it comes to how you kind of, uh, set the borders or mark the borders of Europe, European civilization or Western civilization. That's for a different topic or for a different presentation, I believe. But uh, formally speaking, uh, if we really look at European Union and uh, European Union and, and NATO itself, then we can say that these countries have truly become frontline states, just like uh, their former or their former adversaries in Western Europe used to be during the Cold War. At least when it comes to defense, when it comes to uh, uh, energy security, that's even a more uh, interesting and complicated issue because right now the uh, again unprecedented sanctions policy and the transition policies in the West, mainly going through uh, green transition, not just the United States but also the European Union, which is much uh, um, a bigger deal uh, on our side of the Atlantic. So the sanctions and transition policies cause huge vacuums in in terms of energy security both in terms of uh, main actors, but also in terms of business uh, in East Central Europe. Uh, it's a hot topic anyway, by the way, regardless of the current crises, uh, crisis, uh, but uh, right now, thanks to these two factors, so the ever-increasing sanction policy and the uh, transition policies, uh, the, the way how uh, energy security is being dealt with uh, overall in Europe, but specifically in our region, is, uh, is highly, uh, I think, deserves uh, the, uh, the attention of the, the U.S. Policy, uh, foreign policy decision makers. And lastly, kind of note that in my per, uh, point of view, uh, the uh, uh, regards to the United States presence in the region, an intermarium-like uh, alliance is being for, forming uh, in between some countries in East Central Europe and the United States. Uh, although, although this area pro probably will be its secondary kind of area when it comes to, uh, if I may say so, a new, I won't, I won't say a new world order, that's, that's a very harsh uh, thing to say, uh, especially in a presentation, a Greek presentation like this, but definitely a, a changed international, roughly, roughly changed international environment, again, thanks to the sanction policies and, of course, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. In that kind of new changed international environment, East Central Europe remains probably the secondary area of uh, focus for U.S. foreign policy. So I just wanted to start with uh, geopolitical historical context and background very briefly because I know that most people are pretty much uh, aware of these uh, ideas, uh, starting with geopolitical uh, concepts uh, from the Anglo-Saxon world, specifically from British and uh, American uh, uh, geographers. Most famously, Harvard J. Mackinder, a British geographer, was who noted more than 100 years ago that uh, East Eastern Europe by which he meant a slightly larger area than we're talking about right now in East Central Europe, but partially overlapping that area. Eastern Europe kind of commands, well, those who command Eastern Europe command the so-called heartland. I don't want to read the, the quote over there in the presentation, as you can see it, but what I'm trying to make a point here is just like, uh, how from Mackinder, just like a later Nicholas Spikeman who modified his uh, concept, basically kind of reflected the, the Cold War era of, uh, approach of the uh, United States in theory, in theory when it came to East Central Europe, specifically is that the United States, and that, that was also true for, for Great Britain 100 years earlier, uh, cannot, let, cannot allow that an adversary, a uh, major adversary power, uh, gains uh, basically monopoly in the vast lands of Eurasia. Uh, Nicholas Spikeman famously or infamously uh, referred to even Germany uh, in the Second World War uh, in this matter. So uh, these things are pretty much kind of basic elements of uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon and British and uh, American geopolitics. Uh, just like to note that after the uh, the Cold War, because one can argue that these were kind of Cold War relics in a way, and of course again Eastern Europe uh, and their their. Uh, uh, language or their uh, phrase did not entirely or uh, specifically kind of overlapped uh, our uh, meaning of East Central Europe. But even after the, uh, the Cold War, uh, most famously perhaps Sol, uh, Sol Cohen also noted that Eastern Europe is basically kind of a gateway region uh, from the Atlantic to the heart of, of uh, Eurasia. 
But this is just uh, the theory uh, that we're looking at from, from uh, this side of the Atlantic. If you took a look at the other side, so how East Central Europeans look geopolitics and the relationship with, uh, with the United States, again, there are multiple schools of thought, multiple ideas. Most famous one is, well, the idea that's uh, another the, uh, related to this the series, the Intermarian series. It's come from uh, uh, Polish General Józef Piłsudski uh, in between the two world wars. The concept being, in essence, again, not going into detail, is that these Eastern European, East Central European countries who are kind of stuck in between, both culturally, politically, militarily, in between uh, Germany and Russia, these countries should form some kind of alliance, some kind of cohesive group or a federation or confederation without going in, in, into detail, but definitely some kind of allegiance with the United States kind of balance out most importantly Russian influence, but also when it comes to uh, potential German influence, obviously led by Poland. So this concept uh, was uh, tragic in the sense that it didn't really manifest uh, in real life as, turns, uh, as things turned out uh, in the Second <coughs> World War. The reason I'm pointing it out uh, is because uh, one of the uh, uh, main proponents of this idea today is uh, George Friedman, who kind of argues the same thing with the slight modification, if I may add, that uh, it's not really the countries as a cohesive group that really matters for the United States. It's the larger countries or the more influential countries when it comes to actual military power and economic uh, potential, specifically Poland and Romania. Uh, by the way, uh, he's not alone in that. I recall that uh, in the literature already in the early 2000s, regardless of what kind of geopolitical uh, analyses or, or concepts, uh, even from the Rand Corporation, for example, uh, People more specific, I think Stephen Larrabee was one of the, the uh, authors who noted that yes, it's important to include these countries into NATO, to integrate them, to have stability in the region. But the main prize uh, among these countries is basically, strategically speaking, is Poland and uh, uh, <coughs> Romania. Uh, so, what happened in real life to kind of put all these things that sounds good on paper actually uh, to, to test them in practice? In practice, during the Cold War, we can say, and this is just kind of a, a reminder of, of uh, the things you already know, uh, in the Cold War, the, uh, the region was sort of a quote unquote forgotten area, a forgotten region, as uh, noted by uh, one of the Hungarian scholars, Charles Gott, you see in the middle to the right next to the late uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, obviously, in World War I and World War II before that, it was a zone of conflict. Uh, but during the Cold War, it was politically dead or a forgotten region for the same fact that it was, for the, or, or the simple, uh, simple fact that it was uh, stuck behind the Iron Curtain, this, uh, that side of the Iron Curtain. After the uh, Cold War, when the Iron Curtain fell, there were even then mixed views about theoretical integration. And I just pointed one uh, quote uh, from uh, the late Matthew Albright, who wrote uh, in 1991, the same year when the uh, late uh, uh, George H.W. Bush made the, uh, the, the Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, that uh, Central and Eastern Europe is strategically important to the United States because basically uh, kind of echoing the already outlined idea that uh, that kind of uh, allegiance is uh, providing a, a kind of a, um, a balance against Russia and Germany, just kind of uh, to sum it up uh, in brief. Interestingly, however, uh, it took uh, several years, that was in 1991, it took several years when these countries, or some of these countries, like for example Hungary in my case, but also uh, Czechia and, uh, and Poland, uh, were allowed to, to enter uh, NATO. And that's the reason why I uh, highlighted the late uh, Ron Asmus next to the uh, late Madden Albright to the right. Uh, Ron Asmus, who used to work at the Rand Corporation and later at the State Department, was one of the main architects of actual NATO enlargement. And there's a very good memoir about how that actually took place in between was in 1997 and 1999, when the actual first NATO, NATO's Eastern enlargement took place. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is, is that even then, and I definitely recommend to read these memoirs, even then the views in the West, including the United States, was mixed. The United States was one of the main proponents of actually getting these countries into NATO for different reasons. Uh, but uh, even that there, the, uh, uh, the views regarding the future of this region when it comes to geopolitical uh, background that allegiance was very mixed, including from geopolitical thinkers like Henry Kissinger or the late Smutnya uh, Dzerzhinsky. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a similar kind of note that this kind of uh, this kind of uh, these kind of, uh, countries in this region kind of form a so-called New Europe, countries that understand tyranny, 
uh, more so than, let's say, Western European uh, members of NATO. So therefore, they can be more likely utilized in the global war against terrorism. Uh, like, for example, part of the, uh, the war in the Iraq in 2003, which on paper did, did uh, happen. I mean, these countries were more eager to support that. It really caused kind of tensions within the European Union itself. But the point is, there was no kind of geopolitical idea or uh, uh, great power uh, idea behind uh, the uh, forming the allegiance between the United States and these East Central European countries. There was a specific purpose back then regarding the global war on terrorism. That's uh, one of the, uh, the reasons, for example, why the Baltic states uh, received an already supported push uh, in Washington to be members, full fledged members uh, of NATO. But the point is, it was not really a geopolitical idea behind it. That's why. Uh, again, the aforementioned uh, uh, Charles Gotti noted uh, in the early 2000s, uh, right before the uh, uh, Obama administration took place, that uh, these countries kind of suffer from a sort of checkmark syndrome, which means that they are integrated in the West, formally at least, when it comes to EU, when it comes to NATO, problem solved, let's move to the, well, uh, Near East and then to the Far East. The reason I'm pointing this out because, uh, and this is where basically uh, the, the story gets interesting, but obviously, as we see the current events, that's not really true. Uh, several Atlanticists in the region actually pointed that out already in the summer of 2009 in the uh, famous letter of the 22 uh, in July 2009. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the events or so the developments in 2014 in Ukraine kind of supported their, their argument. That's when the watershed moment kind of occurred in uh, 2014. Uh, of course, more importantly, in my view, the watershed moment happened in late 2017 when the Trump administration issued the National Security Strategy of the United States in December 2017. Reason being, uh, and I don't want to get into more detail because then again, that's uh, kind of part of history, but uh, the 2017 uh, U.S. National Security Strategy was, uh, I'm looking forward to your comments and uh, use on this, in my point of view, one of the first documents, or possibly the first kind of open documents that openly declared the realities of geopolitics, like even using the term geopolitics, first time, uh, openly in these public documents. I think it used, uh, I believe, seven times, whereas even the earlier documents did not use it. Nadia Shago, for example, the person who was supporting H.R. McMaster back then, in uh, uh, putting together the document, actually noted earlier that even the idea of strategic competition or great power competition as it is, was missing from these uh, official uh, documents. So this is when the whole idea uh, came back to, openly at least, from open sources came back to America, uh, US foreign policy thinking the way it's seen in East Central Europe. And the reason I'm highlighting that, that it, this, can be, this could be seen even in uh, nominations, for example, in the State Department. Back then, the uh, Assistant uh, Secretary for European Eurasian Affairs was A. West Mitchell, who was the founder of, of CEPA, the Central, uh, Central European Policy Analysis, the main think tank in Washington, D.C., that primarily focuses on the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so basically, the concepts that were uh, put down in the 2010s by uh, more conservative, more realist uh, thinkers that there is a geopolitical rivalry, a competition that affects directly this region, coming directly from Russia, but not just from Russia, but also from China as well, is a real uh, challenge for the U.S. foreign policy. It was during the Trump administration that this was elevated to sort of at an official level, uh, as highlighted, for example, in 2018 by all the visits, for example, from high-level uh, representatives from uh, East Central Europe to Washington, but also represented in the uh, mil uh, military establishment or the uh, military presence of the United States and NATO being developed further in East Central Europe. Uh, just kind of uh, uh, note on the, this regard, the Kew Research Center actually made uh, 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 polls in 2016-2018 uh, about, for example, the views of the United States uh, in certain European, in a lot of European countries. And for example, uh, the information Poland and Hungary were outliers in both cases in the sense that they went along with the general views in both cases, both under the Obama and the Trump administration, regarding their views of uh, how, they, how confident they are regarding the U.S. administration. But they were outliers in the sense that uh, they were more kind of uh, supportive when it comes to when it came to uh, the Trump administration. Obviously, this is not a representative point because it doesn't include all these Central European countries. There is a similar poll. This, by the way, by the way, the same poll uh, just with a map 
But uh, a, a similar poll was made last year, by the way, from the Pew Research Center, but it's really, I do not include that because no Eastern uh, Central European country is uh, included in that, in that polling. So you can't don't really have uh, comparable data uh, on that. Just a funny and interesting kind of point uh, on this. Uh, if you do a simple Google search, by the way, uh, to type in, for example, Trump in East Central Europe or Eastern Europe uh, and set the time uh, before uh, he was elected, 2016, you basically get uh, uh, findings that these Eastern European countries are pretty much uh, in trouble when it comes to electing the previous president. But if you change the engine so that uh, the uh, finding results uh, come up the, during the second uh, half of the presidency, basically you get the completely opposite result. Is that basically these Eastern European countries are pretty much uh, well off when it comes to attention uh, coming from uh, from Washington. So this is just an interesting uh, kind of uh, note. Uh, briefly. So how things look today? Uh, when it comes to a military presence of the United States, and I don't uh, wish to uh, quote data because if you follow the things uh, that's going on right now, that's happening right now, you're much familiar with uh, the increasing uh, troop deployments and rotations coming from the United States, either on a bilateral level to Eastern European countries or uh, within NATO. This uh, 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 picture uh, from, uh, from the Financial Times actually uh, refers or kind of shows the uh, true presence of NATO uh, countries in Eastern European or the, on the Eastern flank of NATO uh, compared uh, basically from uh, uh, last year, uh, October to March uh, this year. And obviously it's an increase. The interesting thing to uh, look out for is obviously the uh, NATO Madrid Summit that's coming up in a few days. Reason being is that they're going to adopt the uh, new strategic concept hopefully uh, at the uh, Madrid summit, and uh, most likely will deal with the uh, force posture uh, of, uh, of the alliance on the Eastern Front now, or the, uh, the, uh, the Eastern flank. The reason I highlight this, just to give you a, uh, an example of that, uh, a couple of weeks ago I was asked about it, and back in Hungary media and uh, on one of the radios, that the uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO was talking about the 1997 NATO-Russia founding act that uh, specifically says that no permanent troops uh, will be, at least significant number of permanent troops of, of NATO will be deployed in, in new members of NATO. Uh, and uh, that should be kind of modified or changed or uh, should we, we should rethink that policy. Now, uh, the interesting thing about that, the, the reason I'm pointing this out is that, well, I, I told the, uh, <laughs> the colleague at the, at the radio, well, actually, we can talk about it, but there's not much for me to talk about in a sense that everything has been already said in this regard and all the way back in 2014. Is that not a legally binding document, it's a political statement, and of course change, things changed on the ground when the, uh, Ukraine was attacked by Russia already in 2014. The reason I'm pointing this out or mentioning this, uh, this story is that uh, presumably uh, uh, NATO is already kind of uh, reminding people uh, that the force posture will most likely change uh, slight uh, extent uh, on the uh, on the eastern flank, uh, which means again kind of unprecedented change, at least when it comes to the last 30 years of, uh, of military security uh, in, uh, in Europe on, uh, on NATO side. When you look, when you look at specifically the United States, for right now, the United States right now has approximately 100,000 troops in Europe, which is uh, a 20-year uh, uh, record. Uh, it has been more obviously during the Cold War and, and uh, in between the Cold War and uh, before the global war on terrorism. On terrorism. But uh, there's definitely an increasing number of heel-to-toe uh, rotations under the uh, Operation Atlantic Resolve funded by the European Deterrence Initiative, uh, which uh, is uh, not only, uh, well, I will say increasing number because the, uh, the budget of the uh, EDI is not increasing, but it has been moved from the uh, overseas contingency operations to basically the, the base budget. Uh, of the Pentagon, which again kind of a sign that uh, the United States is preparing for a long-term presence here uh, in the region. And interestingly, uh, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, just a couple of months ago noted that it's time to think about, or raise the idea, uh, to think about uh, establishing permanent U.S. bases in Eastern Europe. Uh, now, the reason why that's important, because this, again, has been debated all the way back to, to 2014. This is something of a water, uh, watershed moment as well. Uh, no permanent bases were established in Eastern Europe in the last uh, 20 years based on the uh, NATO-Russia, non-binding NATO-Russia founding act. 
even though several Eastern European countries, most importantly uh, Poland and the Baltic states, have been calling for it already before the, the war against uh, Ukraine. I think the first permanent, uh, first and I think only uh, uh, real permanent base that was established uh, by the United States in Eastern Europe, I think, was in 2011 at the last air base in in, uh, uh, in Poland, uh, which is, we're talking about 10 people. So 10 personnel uh, from the U.S. Air Force, which, which were, were, was uh, responsible for uh, supporting to coordination of uh, forces. Uh, the interesting thing here, obviously, the Global Posture Review recommendations approved by uh, President Biden, which also refers to an increased presence in East Central Europe, mind you, as a secondary uh, importance when it comes to com uh, compared to uh, the, uh, the, the Far East. And what's also important is the military spending of NATO members. Now, I don't want to uh, repeat the 2% uh, threshold kind of argument because everybody's familiar with, with that. Uh, I tried to pick uh, up-to-date uh, data on, on that of how uh, European member states increased their uh, defense spending ever since 2014, shortly, but steadily but shortly. Uh, the sign that, uh, sorry, the uh, the data that's very interesting in this regard is this specific uh, uh, graph, which shows both the 2% uh, threshold and the 20% threshold. The 2% threshold obviously refers to the percentage of GDP uh, that's turned on, uh, on uh, uh, defense expenditure. The 20% refers to of how much that expenditure is actually uh, spent on developing uh, or uh, specifically on the capability uh, development and on uh, uh, getting new equipment, so not just other uh, uh, basic spending. And obviously, you want to be uh, in this area, so on the uh, right top area. The reason I'm pointing this out is that the red spots, uh, if you take a look closely, mostly represent uh, East Central European, or all of them represent East Central European countries, with the exception of Slovenia, if you count them in, in, in this category, and uh, Bulgaria and Czechia. Basically, all uh, the countries are look, uh, turning in that direction or going to that direction, which means that they uh, uh, spend uh, a lot of money on defense uh, expenditure. This uh, graph over here shows that as well. Uh, it shows the 2014 and 2021 expenditure on defense in terms of percentage of GDP. Now, as you can see, most European countries are actually increasing it, but the countries that increase them the, uh, the largest base or the uh, largest level is basically East Central European, uh, unsurprisingly, East Central European countries. Uh, specifically, if you take a look at Latvia, Lithuania, uh, but even Hungary uh, for that matter, uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, Slovakia or the Slovak Republic as well. Uh, the reason I'm pointing this out is uh, that uh, General Milley's uh, remark was followed by uh, an addendum saying that, yes, we need permanent bases in East Central Europe, but probably these bases should be constructed by these countries. So to save costs, not by the United States, but by East Central European countries, should these bases be constructed and maintained. Which is not a new concept. The Poland already came up with that idea several years ago, uh, or that suggestion several years ago, but there's definitely a need for that, uh, specifically among the Baltic states, Romania and uh, Poland. And as I said, these countries, uh, in terms of defense, truly become uh, frontline states. So there's definitely uh, an appetite uh, for investing uh, in uh, defense uh, expenditure, or defense related procurements uh, that are very much looking at uh, for it, uh, in all spectrums. So I'm not just talking about infrastructure or just military bases per se, uh, or just weapons. I'm talking about cyber, I'm talking about all kinds of support <coughs> measures that uh, really kind of make uh, the, uh, the troop deployments. Uh, manageable or realistic to, to actually happen, to actually move troops around. Uh, some of the European deterrence initiative uh, in 2018 and 19 was specifically focused on that area, so how to move uh, the uh, uh, vast number of, of troops, we're talking about thousands and thousands of people, rapidly within a few hours uh, through, uh, through large uh, land masses. The interesting thing here, and this is part of the system, is more of a question actually that I'd like to pose to you. In East Central Europe, the way we see it, it's kind of obvious that the United States focuses on the region and NATO focuses on the region and the, the, the defense expenditure means more uh, business opportunities who are uh, interested in uh, defense procurement. But the interesting thing here is, should Washington outsource uh, the, uh, the task of stabilizing East Central Europe or fulfilling these Central European vacuums 
to Brussels. By Brussels, I mean either NATO or the European Union or not. The reason I'm asking this is that if you take a look at the last 30 years or so, that's what usually happened. I mean, uh, formally, the United States supported membership uh, of these countries in NATO, but basically, as I mentioned, the checkmark syndrome meant that once these members, once these countries were members of the alliance and of the political community, then basically they were, especially in terms of economics, <coughs> uh, turning or, or trending to uh, have more uh, more of a strong bondage with Western European countries, most uh, importantly Germany. So, for example, uh, to get to the point, is that uh, do, does the United States uh, intend to establish a more direct relationship or a do it or self relationship with these countries? In my opinion, it does, but then again, it uh, raises another question what about strategic autonomy? You get it a lot here in Washington, D.C., I assume, and uh, the way I see it, especially among conservative circles, for example, in Washington. Uh, or Israel in the United States, uh, the term uh, strategic autonomy, European strategic autonomy is more annoying uh, the way I see it in Central Europe, but do uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this. Uh, you can argue for strategic autonomy, but if you rely on US presence and you actually call for US presence, military presence, uh, that makes a difference. And again, uh, this is what this is the, the fact from most Eastern European countries then, in a sense, you're actually arguing against the strategic autonomy uh, in, in that matter. Uh, what you are uh, kind of building, if uh, that's the direction you're going, is a more special bilateral relationship with uh, Washington, primarily in between Washington, Warsaw, and uh, Bucharest. The reason I'm highlighting that is that kind of reflects the already mentioned intermarium like relationship that was already uh, brought up by uh, George Friedman. Similar kind of uh, process can be seen uh, in terms of energy security. Uh, the main uh, kind of area of cooperation among these countries should be the Three Seas Initiative, which kind of echoes uh, the intermarium uh, concept, uh, even in its name also in terms of its uh, content. Now, uh, the reason I say it should be because it really relies on, on funding, on money. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, under the Trump administration, this kind of money was raised or possibly uh, being given to, uh, or starter uh, capital uh, was supposed to be given from Washington to uh, these East Central European countries or this East Central European uh, initiative already in 2017. Although uh, direct US involvement in this cooperation is waving in my opinion, more money is basically spent, uh, coming from the European Union projects which primarily do not deal officially with these areas or with this, these initiatives, but with member states and so-called ECI projects, projects of common interest within the European Union. What's really interesting from an East Central European perspective when it comes to US engagement is obviously the, uh, the promise or the, uh, the uh, idea that was raised by uh, President Joe Biden uh, in March, uh, which is meeting with uh, Sarah von der Leyen from the European Commission, that the United States is willing to offer uh, 50 BCM of L uh, American LNG per annum to uh, the European Union. I'm not talking about the region itself, but the European Union. Now, if that happens, even then we're kind of behind when it comes to dependency on Russian gas, but there's a lot more questions that need to be settled in East Central Europe because uh, it's not just the amount of uh, American LNG that's uh, Meant to be a game changer originally uh, with the Three Seas Initiative, uh, but the reason uh, I'm kind of skeptical in this regard is that, uh, first of all, it's, it's not enough if you take out the sheer numbers. Uh, so you, you, you require at least uh, twice or three times more LNG per year if you take a look at the actual consumption in Europe, plus you need a lot of time to do it. Uh, you're probably familiar with the meme uh, when the, the previous president. Uh, was talking about uh, how certain countries, specifically Germany, depends uh, on Russian gas, uh, and the uh, diplomats were certainly were laughing at the, the concept. Nowadays, Germany, I believe, is intending to uh, construct two LNG terminals, which is good for them, but it takes at least two years, and I believe at least one or two billion US dollars to actually construct this LNG terminal, plus with the infrastructure to get the gas moving around in Europe, which is a separate problem in East Central Europe. That's the whole idea of the Free Initiative to establish north-south uh, interconnections between these countries. And these countries have been working on this for several years now, so it's becoming less and less of a problem year by year. The main problem is basically what you fill the, uh, what kind of gas you're going to fill uh, the pipelines with. 
And to do uh, name another example, the key issue uh, highlighted here are the landlocked countries, obviously, because they do not have ports uh, through which they can receive uh, LNG from the United States. But the other problem, which is not highlighted on the slide, is uh, what's seen from East Central Europe, a similar kind of uh, phenomenon that uh, seems to happen here in the United States. Because if you take a look at the uh, the agreement or the joint statement uh, between uh, President Biden and President von der Leyen uh, back in March, they said that uh, you know 15 BCM uh, LNG would come per year. From the uh, American side, this is questionable in a sense of will you actually support the fossil industry to produce the, the, this LNG in the, taking into account that you know Easter, uh, East, uh, Far Eastern markets or other markets in the world are not going to pay a higher price for that. And the other thing on the European side, which is less of a question because it probably will happen, is to actually convince uh, some of the countries that even though it's more expensive uh, than Russian gas or other forms of natural gas uh, or of gas from other places, you're more better off in terms of security of buying much more expensive, a lot about four or five times expensive uh, American LNG than, uh, for example, Russian gas. Again, which is that's a question because nowadays it's no, no question uh, in any kind of country that you should move away from uh, Russian dependency. But again, it takes time. It's a lot of money. As you know, the uh, gas prices uh, are it's not just an economic issue, it's a political issue as well. So you can win and lose elections when it comes to uh, the gas prices. It's a very sensitive topic, not just in East Central Europe, I might add, but in Western Europe as well. Uh, so uh, we're kind of playing the same game uh, in Europe when it comes to the European Union uh, itself. Just uh, the same game as happens here in the, in the United States is that on the one hand, we're saying that we're going to, uh, we want to have green transition. Uh, the European Union introduced all kinds of uh, uh, regulations and uh, and rules when it comes to uh, providing EU funds to certain energy projects, all of them kind of dependent on how green that technology is, uh, which makes sense if you want to have green transition, of course, uh, but uh, you can see signs already that certain member states, uh, several member states actually, are turning away from that temporarily. i just give you an example. The, uh, if I may say, funniest kind of example came from Germany just recently when the Minister uh, responsible for environment, who's also a uh, politician of the Green Party, actually argued for uh, reopening coal mines or basically coal firing plants. It's kind of an odd situation if you're if you tend to uh, say that uh, you're green. I mean, in this situation, you have to have this kind of extreme uh, measures. But the point is, uh, you can say that you want to rely on fossil fuels for the time, but if you argue at the same time that actually in the mid and longer term, the idea is to get rid of fossil fuels. And obviously, this kind of uh, questions uh, the, uh, the investors' uh, uh, well faith in actually putting their money uh, into that sector. I know that you have this argument here in the United States as well, but the same argument can be made uh, back uh, in Europe. I would say to more uh, uh, to a stronger uh, extent. So that's why I say that there are several vacuums created uh, in uh, East Central Europe in this regard. The map here shows basically the the well the scale of the problem. Uh, this is uh, directly from the uh, European Commission. Uh, so it shows all the LNG terminals uh, or ports uh, in uh, Europe. Some of them are you know, already operating, some of them are operating and are looking forward to development. Some of them are just, uh, well, uh, unlikely to be developed or are just being planned. Mark <coughs> for example. But basically, if you take a look at East Central Europe, most of these countries, with the exception of Croatia and, uh, and Poland, do not really have access to American LNG right now. And it gets even trickier than that because basically uh, the sanctions are about pushing the Russians out of Europe, rightfully so. The problem is, is that the Russian in, uh, infiltration into the uh, European and East Central, not just East Central Europe, but overall European economic area is basically like cancer in the last uh, 30 years or so. I'll just give you one example. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a debate on, uh, not a major debate, but among, uh, among the stakeholders. So not on high politics level, but among stakeholders that uh, uh, countries want to buy uh, gas from the Kirk terminal, which is in uh, uh, Croatia. They want to purchase gas from that terminal. Now you have to have agreements in prior to actually purchase the gas. And some uh, member states could not purchase, or, com or national companies in that, those, those member states could not purchase gas from there. 
uh, for the simple reason that other companies have already been faster at moving ahead of them and actually buying the gas on paper. And it turned out that the, one of the companies that were faster or more slick when it came to actually uh, buying the gas on paper turned out to be on paper, I, I believe they're a Croatian or Slo uh, Slovenian company on paper. But if you take a look at the background, you basically notice that they were talking about two Russian guys. So uh, it's not just the overt kind of Russian infiltrations of do you get your gas from Gazprom or not. It's also basically how uh, uh, the, the business connections and business relations have any connection with the uh, Russian uh, business, business person. And we're talking about single people here as well. Yes? What about the Russian connections to the Hungarian uh, oil market? At the lowest prices of gas in Europe, which was those connections. So uh, the lowest. How would you comment on that? Uh, when it comes to the oil, when it comes to the gas, because you started with the oil petrol. and then. When it comes to the petrol. I mean, yeah, petrol. Gas. Right, oh yeah, that's the, this is the, the, the European phrase here. But when it comes to the, the petrol or the, or the oil, uh, this is basically the uh, national oil company mall makes a lot of the profit when it comes to purchasing that, that oil uh, from. Uh, you're right from Russian sources, uh, but there have been efforts to move along from that point. Like, for example, the current uh, government is basically criticized for that, uh, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. for this uh, Russian connection. But the very same political force, very same government actually, I believe in the early two ta uh, 2010s, uh, moved to, to buy a large portion of the, of the mall company package back from, uh, from the Russian sources, obviously for, sorry, for Russian uh, owners. That was back in the early 10s. And the government received a lot of criticism, at least internally, it was a lot of domestication. They received a lot of criticism for that, that they it, was, it wasn't a good deal because they paid a higher price than they should have, at least when it come to, uh, came to market value. Uh, but then again, in retrospect, if you take a look at that, it was a very good decision. So I'm not saying that there is not uh, uh, kind of Russian dependency, but it's definitely <coughs> But they have moved from that point uh, to another direction. It's definitely a decision to do so. I mean, it's kind of a right uh, right now. Overall, it's not, not just the oil. It also overall, <coughs> it's, uh, it's a very tricky situation because uh, I used to say to, to American colleagues that the Europeans in general, if I may say that as European, we tend to sit on a high horse because it's not just the uh, hungry the East European built. Uh, uh, stakeholders, especially European stakeholders as well, who kind of, you know, uh, when they, when they uh, approach the uh, uh, European Council meetings or other forums, uh, they basically argue that they want to have, for example, an oil embargo, but they're not really interested in that. that. For example, just recently, I think the sixth uh, EU sanction, uh, sixth uh, package of EU sanctions was supposed to include the full oil embargo. That was the first idea. Uh, and a huge spotlight was expected to be shed on Hungary per se, for the reason we mentioned. Uh, but then I think, actually Politico itself actually wrote about that uh, the day uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Prime Ministers and the, and the European Council meeting was held. That actually, uh, even Germany and German, Austrian, and I believe Italian stakeholders as well, uh, but other countries as well, is not really interested in the oil embargo itself because they're, they're Economies depend so much on that. If you talk uh, with Western diplomats on that, you get the sense that uh, there's a really uh, kind of nervousness in the air of how long that can be maintained. Because I said it's not just an issue of economics, it's also an issue of political stability. So, to answer, briefly answer the question, it's a complicated issue because it's not just Hungary, it's all the countries as well who are dependent on that. You can pinpoint now certain countries, of course, you can do that. Uh, but uh, there is, there is a science, in my opinion, that other countries are also in that as well. And it's a difference, if, for example, if let's say, if they were talking about, for example, if Hungary or other country would be in veto uh, the sanctions, which uh, in a way did not happen that was expected by, by some pundits. But if, for example, a small country vetoes, it sounds different, for example, if, for example, Germany vetoes, politically speaking. Yeah. You know, so so there uh, and there were uh, analysis, I believe, on that subject earlier. So not today, uh, but earlier, a few uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that uh, the way the, the meetings, for example, in the European Council are done, uh, are actually uh, not just in uh, when it comes to embargo and, and sanctions, but other areas as well. For example, on uh, voting of the uh, Europe, the Euro zone uh, rule, is, uh, infringements are are happening or not. 
kind of reflect real politic kind of realities on the ground. I mean, it did happen in the early 2000s, I believe. I think it was Greece, the first country who, uh, this is a different topic, by the way, just, just, just a similar example. I think the first country who faced uh, consequences, political consequences, for breaching uh, the, uh, the uh, rules uh, within the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, Maastricht, the Maastricht criteria when it comes to how uh, you pay with the euro or the requirements that you need to meet. Uh, to pay with the euro. I think it was Greece who had to face the, the first consequence in the early 2000s, even though, if you take a little look at the uh, requirements, I, I believe Germany and France uh, would have been equally kind of guilty of that. The fact is, the process goes, and at that particular issue, for example, that the uh, European Commission, as the defender of the treaties, kind of you know, waved the flag that, look, there's an infringement over there, we're going to start the process. But the vote is actually happening in the Council of the European Union. And there is basically when intergovernmental relations come in. So that's a different topic, but uh, a similar kind of uh, uh, issue that, uh, that kind of that, that's, uh, is happening. Uh, so that's why I just brought it up. But again, it's a different issue. Uh, so uh, just to, to keep the time, the, uh, the assessment here is that uh, there are vacuums when it comes to energy security in East Central Europe. Uh, that are going to happen partially because of the sanctions, uh, as, as I noted earlier, but also because of the green transition processes. And that kind of creates, I believe, major, invest, major uh, investment opportunities for not just American, but also Western European investors when it comes to production, storage, and lines. Uh, obviously, the main, uh, the main uh, factor in this, uh, in addition to what I already said, so the sanction policies and the transition requirements in the European Union is the uh, EU funding uh, opportunities. Uh, you know, to give you an example, the uh, European Union also has a uh, COVID relief package, just like in the United States. The only difference is that that uh, relief package, we're talking about uh, more than 600 billion euros for the, the member states. Uh, that package is not distributed similarly as the, or the same way as the uh, uh, standard kind of uh, structural funds or cohesion funds or the standard EU budget. So basically you get the money and then you pay it, then you uh, use it, and then seven years later you have to make reports on how well you've done uh, the uh, use of those funds. It's the other way around. You basically uh, 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 hand in plans, or RRPs, reconstructions and resilience building plans that kind of reflect of how you would like to use those funds to rebuild your reconstruct your uh, economy after COVID, you get the money, and basically if that plan is approved in prior, technically you're good to go if, if everything is approved. Now a lot of those uh, segments within the plan actually call for all kinds of green uh, transition uh, well requirements, which is on the one hand was very good, on the other hand, it was written before the, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, I mean the real crisis, the, the, the actual uh, tragic war that's going on right now actually occur. So there is kind of a critique about that of, of how kind of it ties the the, uh, the countries kind of hands and the, the member states hands in actually uh, using the, the funds to be more resilient uh, to a different kind of threat, namely energy dependency from Russia. When it comes to the United States, uh, the, the, there is definitely a desired U.S. engagement, as I mentioned, when it comes to American LNG. The question is really the, the determination under the green transition, as I already indicated. The other is market and political barriers. Uh, I have no doubts that American LNG has a place in the European market. I'm pretty sure that it does. Uh, it's already been uh, proposed several years ago under the Trump administration. I, I believe uh, it was actually a very public event in Poland, that when the first LNG uh, shipments arrived a few years ago, so that's actually a publicity stunt uh, in this regard. The, the question is really the amount, uh, the market realities of actually you can actually sell uh, the LNG in the, the uh, European uh, on the European market. So overall, when it comes to the conclusions, I would say that Ukraine brought a decisive change. These countries have become frontline states, real frontline states uh, in a kind of new international. Uh, uh, environment, an environment that's more representing the block system, I believe, and to get into detail, we need to talk about China as well, but I, uh, obviously this is uh, not in this presentation. In this presentation. Uh, the other thing is that a partially overt real politics will probably come back into the Committee of Values. 
Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Poland is definitely a staunch ally of the United States, understandably so for historical and security reasons. One of the issues that has been raised in Poland, uh, just like in Hungary, by the way, is the rule of law issue from uh, uh, from uh, uh, United States. Uh, and uh, basically, well, according to certain analysis, don't really see that happening right now, simply because, strategically speaking, Poland is more important of an ally when it comes to uh, being a frontline state in terms of defense than other countries in Central Europe. The question really is how to realign the policies. So how to realign uh, the uh, military and uh, uh, energy security policies to the new realities on the ground. Specifically, what are the limits of the uh, United States engagement politically, militarily, and economically here in the region? Uh, this sounds like a basic uh, question, but it is not. So uh, I'll give you an example. According to all of the documents I have seen, at least when it comes to uh, US foreign policy, Basically, the primarily focus is still continues to be going all the way back to the Obama administration and China uh, or the Indo-Pacific. Understandably so if you take a look at the big picture. But again, this raises the question of how uh, the, uh, the vacuums in, in East Central Europe are going to be, or the filling of the vacuums are going to be outsourced, so to say, uh, to European, Western European countries by Washington. I don't see that happening. I'm pretty sure that uh, this this is an unprecedented situation in the East Central Europe. An unprecedented American attention is being uh, held uh, in terms of intelligence, in terms of uh, military presence, and I would say even in terms of uh, investment. Uh, but the question is, what are the exact limits of those? Frankly speaking, I don't know. Uh, because uh, the sanctions, uh, without criticizing them, the sanctions create uh, a new environment where basically an Eastern act can't be Russians. Speaking to come back to the quick uh, uh, pipeline example, uh, so uh, there's uh, the increasing number and, uh, and content of, of uh, sanctions are actually uh, making it more complicated for uh, investors to move around, uh, but also it gives more opportunities. So, again, I'm not criticizing the sanctions, I'm just saying that it's kind of uh, introduces a new reality on the ground. The other question that's far for the future is who will rebuild Ukraine and how. Uh, because that country needs to be rebuilt, as, as you all know, and obviously uh, uh, the uh, line of investment will probably uh, reflect the line of uh, support uh, for Ukraine, as it should. Uh, but uh, and I have to leave the the, uh, the this question open. Sadly, is again we don't really know how how things will turn out. Uh, in these obviously we're looking for Ukraine's success and uh, and. Uh, uh, westward integration, but then comes the real question, how will you rebuild the country and from what sources? I mean, the United States has been very uh, 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 I'll say, uh, great hard when it comes to uh, getting several billion dollars, several billions of dollars, more than 50 or 60 billion dollars so far just in the last year to Ukraine in terms of humanitarian defense support, uh, understandably so. Obviously, you need a lot more funding for that. Hypothetically, the European Union, again, should take care of the issue. Uh, but keep in mind that the whole Ukraine crisis was originally the European problem. And originally, if you take, uh, if you, uh, take a step back and take a look at the issue, originally it was about uh, Ukraine signing uh, a, um, an agreement with the European Union that started the issues. I mean, you can say that, some people say that the Americans started it and that the Americans kind of pulled the bear. I, I personally don't agree with that assessment, uh, but formally speaking, it's more of a, it should be more of a European problem. So the last question of who will rebuild Ukraine and how, I tend to say that those sort were going to increase the American presence, simply being that uh, the, uh, the defense sector and actually the support of Ukraine is actually led by the United States. So understandably, the reconstruction should be led by the United States as well. I mean, who pays the check? Uh, that's uh, that's kind of the term. So who's going to call? Uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, requirements or the specifics of reconstructing that country. But uh, sadly, I don't know what's going, uh, going to happen, and uh, we're pretty much looking forward to it as soon as possible. Uh, I'm going to leave you with those questions, and thank you for your attention and uh, your remarks so far. But looking forward to your questions and remarks as well, and uh, I'm looking forward to your thoughts because uh, there are several things that we did not touch upon. There are several things that I'm looking forward to learn from you as well, from uh, who are all uh, experienced in either this specific area or other specific related areas. So I'm really looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you.
And thank you for the question, by the way. Does anyone have a question? We have time for one or two. <laughs> This is probably an impossible question, but uh, how does an invasion of Taiwan, a former member, affect this? In Central Europe, you mean? Yeah. Well, uh, I would look at, uh, obviously that's the uh, the parallel that's being brought off from the very beginning, uh, even in East Central European analyses, uh, that uh, that the uh, what <coughs> what's happening in Ukraine is kind of uh, a test, so to say, uh, when it comes to uh, Taiwan. Uh, to be honest, uh, I, I don't know the answer, uh, because uh, the, uh, the events on uh, uh, Potential events in Taiwan or the, the Far East is beyond the uh, planning uh, procedure of, uh, of East Central European countries. I do recall uh, that, for example, under the Obama administration, when officially the, uh, the pivot, the strategy of the pivot or rebalance of probably the like, actually affected the planning of these countries. Uh, I think the, the Czech Republic or Czechia, and uh, I believe in Poland, the, the official documents included that the fact of the matter is basically the uh, United States is preoccupied with. This is how I say Taiwan over the potential invasion of Taiwan, but they're probably more uh, focused on that. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the way it would impact uh, the situation that's already uh, visible right now is the economic impact of it. Uh, so uh, the uh, even Ukraine itself uh, already in the first couple of months showed huge economic impacts in East Central Europe. Uh, partially because a lot of the production lines were in uh, Ukraine and those production lines were broke. I would even argue that uh, the, uh, not, 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 just, not just the sanctions, but already the fact that, uh, United, that uh, Russia attacked Ukraine actually caused more of a disturbance in the global, or at least the East Central European uh, production lines uh, than COVID did. Because COVID kind of, uh, it did not fragment it to that extent. It did cause disturbances. And you can see that in terms of supply and demand, uh, just like uh, other parts of the world. But it did not uh, kind of uh, shatter the, uh, the way it uh, the way the, the crisis in Ukraine did. Now, that, uh, now an attack against Taiwan, I would uh, I would say that especially uh, uh, with the semiconductors, definitely uh, affect that. For example, the uh, auto car industry. A lot of the auto car industry, a lot of the East Central European countries rely on uh, the, the German auto car industry, and that kind of uh, depends on receiving uh, chips uh, from primarily from Taiwan. I'll just give you a very specific example on the ground. One of my colleagues is actually thinking of purchasing a new car. Uh, first of all, the uh, the prices regards regards of the inflation have gone up, so uh, people who were thinking of buying a car they should have bought it way earlier. Uh, that includes me as well. I kind of uh, feel regret about that. But the point is, uh, he, my friend who thought to, uh, my colleague who thought to, to purchase a car, they already said, and he has the money to do it. He said he had to wait, wait at least one year because of the chips right now. Uh, and this is regardless of the East Central European uh, construction line because we're talking about a specific model that's not produced in East Central Europe. But if you think about it, that these cars, uh, we're talking about mainly German cars. The car in the question right now is Japanese one, but uh, we're talking about uh, German cars. That will affect the, uh, the national economy to, I believe, a very harsh extent. So we're pretty sure that the invasion of Taiwan, regardless when it happens, by the way, regardless before or after the midterm elections, uh, I would say that it had it would have a huge impact on the uh, on the auto car industry in East Central Europe. Right now, if you take a look at the statistics, the GDP growth in East Central Europe is actually stronger than in Western Europe. But obviously, you have to consider that the overall GDP is lower uh, than Western European countries. You have to calculate that as well. Uh, but I would think that that's the first impact that will definitely be felt uh, in our region, uh, and to a very strong extent because a large uh, portion of the economy relies on that one single sector. Uh, when it comes to Slovakia and, and Hungary, for example, I, I, can, I can say that. When it comes to other countries, I'm not sure about the specifics, but I'm pretty sure that just in that one single sector, we, went, we will feel the, the, the impact of that. Very brief, a very brief and very short time. There's already, uh, it's already been felt right now, but that's obviously because of the, uh, the 
the, uh, the trends that were developed in the last few decades. You talked about the energy situation. What would you expect to happen next, sir? When it comes to embargoes or when it comes to development of uh, what comes to embargoes? Uh, I think that the gas embargo uh, in one way or another is going to happen. There are three scenarios that I can think of. Number one, the, the standard scenario that Western European countries, not just Western, but uh, usually European countries were looking uh, for, is to introduce an embargo. Uh, that's the most unlikely, uh, simply for uh, the reasons as the oil embargo did not happen the way, for very same reasons. I mean, countries are just too dependent on Russia and they're afraid to sacrifice the national economy. It's a harsh thing to say, I know, but these are the facts on the ground. Uh, if it weren't that the situation, that were the situation, it would have happened by now. Uh, because everybody knew, knew, uh, knew, even before the crisis, that it's the gas that's really uh, make the, uh, the Russian uh, it's the gas embargo that's really make the Russian economy hurt. By the way, the, the sanctions are working just uh, in practice. So I did not criticize the sanctions. They are working. I mean, one of my colleagues went to uh, several several years ago to uh, Russian uh, uh, well sites and uh, uh, Russian. Uh, well, they ha it had a glimpse of how, how the Russian uh, energy market works. And obviously, it's underdeveloped compared to, for example, the U.S. energy sector. But not only that, it's very dependent on Western technology. So uh, uh, just the, uh, the sanctions itself, regardless whether you're buying or not buying Russian gas, is going to hurt the Russians very much if it hasn't hurt them already. The question is, uh, is whether, I mean, you're familiar with the idea of where sanctions work in general on a, on a non-Western thinking society, if I may say that. Uh, because in my opinion, we can argue about that, in my opinion, the, the track record of sanctions is not that, not that good overall, universally speaking. But when it comes to uh, numbers that in terms of economics, they are, they are definitely working. So that's one scenario that the uh, European Union will introduce uh, a gas embargo, which is, I think it's unlikely. The other scenario is not a gas embargo, but uh, an increased uh, uh, an increased uh, uh, tariffs on introduce on uh, imported gas from Russia. For that, you not you do not need the same. Uh, voting uh, uh, ratio as you need for the embargo in the Council of the European Union. That way you basically go around the countries, the member states that not really prefer the uh, gas embargo. Uh, I, I don't see that happen uh, to be, uh, it's more realistic, but I don't see that going to, that's going to happen for the very same reason the gas embargo did not happen. Again, you need the large stakeholders actually support uh, to do it. And the third scenario, which already some people are claiming that it might happen, is the other way around, is that uh, Russia will turn for that as a quote-unquote nuclear option, saying that we're going to do uh, switch off the gas. Right now, what you already see examples, even in Hungary, for example, yesterday or two days ago, uh, there was a temporary uh, stoppage of gas support. Russians think that it was a, a technical issue, but it did happen to uh, Poland as well before the war happened uh, uh, through the Yamal pipeline. So there is a possibility that Russia will call up, call up the, uh, the gas. So we, uh, then in that case, the question is what will happen to the Russians uh, and when they were going to do it. Uh, if they plan to do it uh, before the gas storage in Europe is uh, filled uh, to a larger extent, which I believe uh, they are filled right now, at least to a larger extent than they were a couple of months ago. According to the European Commission, we have to fill it at least to three quarters by the end of the year, uh, which we're doing it right now. Uh, if uh, it happens when the gas storages, uh, storages are not failed, then it will be painful for the European countries as well. But if it happens when uh, we do have storage, then in that case, uh, it will be more painful for the Russians, I believe. Um, and also the other thing that kind of uh, uh, translates into this equation is obviously how it will going to work. Uh, but I don't really want on, on that to be, to be precise. So uh, these are the, the three scenarios. As, odd, as oddly as it sounds, I, I think the third scenario is the most likely. Uh, because uh, simply put, I, I don't see European will behind, uh, behind that. Overall, European will behind introducing a de facto uh, gas uh, embargo, as harsh as that may sound, and again, it, you know, it, as, as months pass by, it's more and more unlikely because a possible fatigue will come in, uh, including in Western European uh, nations. That's my understanding of it. I'm, I might be proven wrong, I mean, the European Union has been more united than ever uh, on these issues, 
So I might be proven wrong, uh, but, I don't, but I'm, I'm skeptical in this regard, to be honest. Dr. Tismazia, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you to everyone who was here today. Um, if you're interested in um, attending more of our lectures, they're listed at iwp.edu, um, or if you're interested in making a gift to IWP, you can also go to iwp.edu. And if you're interested in hearing more about energy security and the Russia-Ukraine situation, we're having another event at 3 o'clock. You're welcome to stick around. Um, thank you again so much. Thank you.